I lived every day as if he was the 12th guy on the bench. You know, I think that's a very powerful message to have and something that hopefully the players that are now and players that will come later um, choose to embody as well. Welcome to a very special edition of The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols. I'm alongside two of Kobe's former teammates, NBA champions, Matt Barnes, Robert Ori. Today we are celebrating the legacy of Kobe Bryant, who of course, one year ago today, died tragically along with his daughter Gianna and seven others. And coming up on the show, we are going to have a number of people who are part of Kobe and Gianna's lives joining us, plus numerous current NBA stars reflecting on the first time they faced Kobe in a game. We've been working on this project for weeks. We cannot wait to share it with you. But first, there was no one like him. I've worked in this business for more than 25 years. I have covered everyone from Muhammad Ali to Michael Jordan, from Joe Montana to Tom Brady, from Serena Williams to Tiger Woods. And I can tell you for sure, there has never been anyone quite like Kobe Bean. He could burn with intensity one minute and make mischief the next. He was wildly creative but at the same time, maddeningly precise. He was not perfect. He had flaws, he did things that he would come to deeply regret, but he also understood that what you did next, how you move forward, that mattered deeply. And he made the absolute most of every minute, every day, every year that he was with us. I actually saw him not that long before he died, and I remember so clearly that day how we were joking about having crossed the threshold of having known each other for more than half our lives and what that meant about how old we had both gotten. Of course, now, all I can think about is how young he was when he was taken from us. How young that sweet, funny, smart, talented girl was, and what a tragedy it is for the family that was left behind. And to that end, we want to make clear that over these next two hours, we are keeping front and center the words of Vanessa Bryant, who recently posted on Instagram that she knew today would be full of remembrances of her late husband. She wrote, quote, I want to thank everyone that has handled their media coverage respectfully. To everyone else, please reconsider your news story and look at your footage through the eyes of their children, spouse, parents, siblings, and family. Celebrate their lives, not the day they lost them. So that is what we are going to do today. We are going to celebrate the extraordinary. And we're not the only ones. Last night, Kyrie Irving arrived at his game wearing a Kobe number eight jersey. And he told the cameraman, you know who I'm rocking tonight? Robert, Matt, I know this day has been on the calendar. You knew it was coming. But Robert, why don't we start with you? What do you remember about your friend today? What, what's it bringing up for you? You know, for me, um, I got to know Kobe when he was a rookie. And I got traded to the Lakers, and it was all this hype around this high school kid. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, hadn't seen him play yet. So I get into practice, and it's a shoot around. And he's going a thousand miles an hour. And I'm looking at him like, dude, slow down. He's like, I gotta get better, I gotta get better. And that was just his whole mentality. He wanted to get better each and every day. And I'm looking at him like, dude, it's shoot around. Nobody's going 100 miles per hour. But the thing about him is you just knew he was destined to be great because he had that energy and that work ethic like no other. And for me to have that moment to see what he could become and to have a lot of conversations with this guy and share some of my knowledge with him. And I remember when we finally had that first one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> the first thing out of his mouth was, tell me about Dream's footwork. I'm like, I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking, you know, but it was just that. He wanted to get nice better. to see you too, he, yeah, he wanted to learn from the guy that had the best footwork in the game. And that's just who he was. His whole mentor was to get better and to try to be the best at that game. And all I could do was sit back and just respect him and just watch him. And believe it or not, learn from him. Because even though you're a vet coming off two championships, you watching this guy put in his work each and every day and you learning from like, oh, I can't let this young fellow out work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you just wanted to go on and move on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, mine is, is kind of post-career, obviously, you know, our battles that have been well documented, but just the person outside of basketball, Kobe, the, the, the man, the father, the businessman, and how 
although basketball was over, he still attacked everything with that same passion, desire, and focus. Um, the way he fathered, um, how adamant he was about trying to put his last 20 years behind him, his mm -hmm. greatness in basketball, and, and be known for what was next. Uh, he was always trying to innovate. He was always trying to get better, get himself better. Oh, you guys found this footage. <laughs> this was you, um, of course, so with just, your sons. I mean, really, Kobe. you know, he was Uncle Kobe to the boys, you know, and like I said, it's, since, since when we became teammates, the twins were like three, and he started, you know, treating them like he was his own, bringing them shoes all the time, hugging them, talking to them, bringing them in the locker room. So he was just a special person. Obviously, we know how amazing on the court he was, but he did just uh, as amazing things off the court as well. I love you talking um, over the past year a little bit about how you guys were these great rivals, right? And of course, we, we all know the flinch video, the whole thing. But that when you did become teammates, the kinship you found yeah. with each other, stages of your lives you were going through and just yes. sort of... It was an instant brotherhood. You know, we were both going through things in our personal life and we really just bonded. Um, practice, after practice, uh, you know, post games, going out and grabbing a drink or grabbing some dinner. And really, like I said, getting the chance to really learn each other as, as men um, outside of uh, outside of the basketball court. And that's what my fondest memories of him was, of just really getting a chance to know. Because it, Rob will tell you, he doesn't let too many people in. And Correct. if he allows to let you in, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, once he lets you in, it's a wonderful thing, like he said. And there's so many moments that we share privately and it's, it's amazing to me that he has moments with everybody people, is different right. every yeah. story is different Stories it's almost amazing, like yeah. he put everybody in the category and says okay i'm gonna talk with you about kids you know with cars mm -hmm. you about footwork and it's it, he to me it's almost like it was three or four different kobe's out there that he was in different places at, at different times because you hear the stories you're like I was around that time. <laughs> well, well, how did he get there? What, what is it going on? But right. it's, it's so many stories. I, I, I think having my, my one of my other favorite stories is just when you have those long plane rides. Right. Uh, and you have the moments just sit down and you talk about everything outside of basketball. You know, we, I talked to him about his times growing up as, as a kid in a foreign country. And he talked about me growing up in the South and how it was. And, you know, and a little thing. And all of a sudden you're like, dude. You don't play spades? I'm like, every black person in America plays spades. You don't know how to play? And you sit there and you're teaching this guy how to play spades. You know, it's just, it was just like a big brother kinship. But it was so many memories like that that you sit back on a day like the day and you just think about it. Even the last memory I have of him is meeting him at Mamba Academy a week before this, this, this tragedy happened and just laughing and joking and talking about everything other than basketball. basketball. That was mm -hmm. my favorite part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's funny too, post-career, Matt, as you say, I mean, he was so focused, as we know, for so much of his time. And Robert, you playing with him from the moment he stepped onto a basketball court in the NBA for the first time, saw that development, right? Tracy McGrady has talked a lot about how they used to be so close. And then there was basically a 10-year period where t Kobe was just so tunnel vision, so consumed by the game. And then that ended. And even in the later days of his playing career, and then certainly post-basketball, it was almost like he was starving to me. To me, it felt like he was starving for all the things he had missed in that tunnel vision time. And as you say, Robert, he wanted to be everywhere. He would love to sit and talk to you for 45 minutes. <laughs> he would do everything. And I loved getting to see that part of him. And I think that's part of what, it's part of what makes this so hard, is that he had so much left to do. And Gianna, as you said, Matt, you, you were around each other's kids. I got to be around Gianna a few times in a way that just really get to know her and know how special she was. She could have ended up being mm. the greatest women's basketball player ever. And Diana Taurasi will tell you that, <laughs> too. And just the potential that we lost. And I think it's a great, not that we need it, but today is a great reminder to hug your kids, mm -hmm. hug your family. Always. Mm -hmm. And um, remember that the impact you have on everyone around you matters. Because I think that's what we see when we see all of this outpouring of love and affection for Kobe from other NBA players, from people here in Los Angeles, where he was literally the symbol of the city for 20 right. years. For people who knew his beautiful family, his daughters, his wife, Vanessa, the impact you have, the way you touch people in every interaction, in every moment. It matters, and it mattered with Kobe, and we'll be talking about that through the rest of this show. In fact, coming up, you will hear LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and many more talking about what Kobe meant to them from the very first time they got to play against him. First, though, right after this break, we're going to check in on current Lakers, right? Beat the Cavs last night to remain a perfect 10-0 on the road. LeBron scored 46. Credit his performance his to trash talking from a Cavs employee. I will explain all of this after the break. 
got to get myself back together to talk about basketball, guys. Okay. And one of the biggest Lakers fans in the world. Also, he happened to be the man that Kobe Bryant asked to do the national anthem on the night of his last game. They had a great relationship. Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers here to help us celebrate Kobe. Thank you so much, friend, for joining us. We really appreciate it. I'll just start asking you the same question I asked Robert and Matt. What memories are brought up for you on a day like today? Uh, it's a flood of memories. And, you know, waking up today and realizing it was the anniversary of his death. Like, I mean, firstly, just that this entire year has gone by without him. And what a touchstone he was for our city um, on a multitude of levels, you know, as an athlete. But as an athlete, the amazing things that he did, the transcendent acts on the basketball court, are it's not so much for me personally what he did it's how what he did made me feel and i think that's a universal thing it's what it what it made us all feel right it's like when someone dedicates themselves to a craft so completely and transcends so profoundly it it, it satisfies a yearning in all of us because every one of us every one of us yearns to be better we yearn to be better as as human beings as friends as as you know as as lovers as whatever field we're in whether it's arts or academics or athletics or whatever our labor is of life we all yearn to be better when someone shows us like how far you can take it it's inspiring and it touches us and you know for someone like me and for the many of us that are basketball fanatics uh we know that basketball is a vehicle for the most profound expression of human spirit and and kobe embodied that to you know to the furthest extent that we could ever imagine and um i'm so grateful for him and i you know i can't help but think back to that day a year ago when when he passed and how absolutely devastating it was to get that news and you know because we were watching this guy evolve not just you know as an athlete he evolved through his career from being so arrogant in the beginning to to bringing in his teammates in a more complete way to as his career evolved but also as a human being you know yeah just it became warmer and kinder and more inclusive and then you know after he retired all the work he did with with his daughter and and you know women's basketball and bringing attention to it and how important that was, you know, gender equity in sports. And, and um, you know, and to think back to that day, like you're sitting there devastated that Kobe left us. And then we hear that his beautiful little girl was gone. And it was, you know, absolutely crushing. And, um, you know, it's a time for memory and it's a, it's a very solemn thing. No, that's all. Yeah, that's just, it's so eloquently put, the idea of what he made you feel, that Maya Angelou quote, right? That, that, that is Kobe to a mm -hmm. T. And I, I do want to honor Vanessa's wishes by focusing on points in his life. And it is funny, mm -hmm. for all the championships, for all the great moments, that last night, Flea, that last night, I am so, I feel just so honored to have been in the building for his <laughs> final performance. And you did a lot more than that. He asked you to be the one to do the national anthem that night. What did that mean to you? And just also to see him drop 60 in his exit. <laughs> uh, what, what do you remember about that night? Um, uh, that I wanted to do a good job for him, to honor him. Um, and then it was, you know, just thinking about his whole career. I met him uh, before he ever played a game for the Lakers after mm. they drafted um, and, you know, I didn't know Kobe well at all. I, I was, you know, I met him a few times and always, he was always kind and generous with his time with me. Um, but I just wanted to honor him and to, to do the best at my craft, you know, that I could. And as the best that I could do for him and to channel God, to channel the spirits and to be a conduit for all that is good about humanity, you know, and do my best as an evolving person. Uh, to honor him. That's all I ever wanted to do in that regard. Well, you've done that, certainly, and mm -hmm. more. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's yeah. good to see you again. And uh, I know, I know that Toby's in your heart, not just today, but every day. Thank you, Play. We appreciate it. Okay, Rachel. Bye-bye. All right, guys, we are going to talk a little basketball here today because we're a basketball show. And let's face it, 
Kobe loved to play hoops. He loved watching all these guys whose hands he left the league in. So let's do it. Let's look at some of the games and stuff that happened last night. It is, as you guys know, a make or miss league. Make emphasis. Mm. Timberwolves, Warriors, rookie Anthony Edwards taking off, flying past an outstretched rookie James Wiseman for that huge jam. Matt, I, I, you see the number one pick here, right? <laughs> Scary. He's starting to develop. You know, what I like about him, he's a dog. He has a football player background, so he's no, you know he's never going to back down. Once his skill level, you know, the two or three years into the game start matching his tenacity, he's going to be a real problem for, that, uh, for the league. Yeah, especially when moments like this, one versus two, mm -hmm. you know he was thinking <laughs> yes. that. I'll see you down there. I'm going to show you why I was number one right, right here. And he goes in there for the jam. This guy is athletic beyond craziness. So if he can just channel it, you know, when you want to talk about mama mentality, this yep. guy needs it because he has all the talents in the world to be a great basketball player. Absolutely. There was so much talk going into the draft. You're like, oh, it's not that rich or deep a draft. But the top picks, man, they're already they're showing well. out. Miss acting here, Thunder Blazers. Watch oh, Gary uh, Gary Trent Jr. Will reach, will reach by Shea uh, Gilders Alexander. Uh, oh, full belly flop. I don't there. know how you felt, Rob, but I hated, I hated flopping. I, I, I hate, flopping. I, you know. Only time I would flop was in the playoffs because we might need that foul or something. You only, you only do it important. You can't do it through the whole season. Now everybody thinks you're a flopper. You got to right. wait. Right. You got to strategically the, the big those moments. moments. The big moments. <laughs> right there. Boom. <laughs> Make strategy. Heat Nets. Let's move on there. After being shut down by security on their attempted jersey exchange over the weekend, which I just want to point out again, the league <laughs> told Heat Security to do this. They told our friend Dave Holcomb to do that. He was doing his job. But on Monday, Monday, Kyrie Irving and Bam did share a little exchange there. Uh, Bam walking off, tucked Kyrie's jersey out under his own there. <laughs> I, you know, it's a good strategy there, right? It just makes zero sense to me. You can battle against someone, sweat on them, wrestle with them for two and a half hours, yes. and you can't say bye after the game. I, I understand they're trying to take every precaution, but it yeah. just doesn't make so much sense to me. And for, for Bam should understood also, dude, you had a career high that night. You don't give that jersey up. You keep that. You actually steal it from the staff and you take it home. That's what I did. <laughs> well, he took Kyrie's. I don't know. I don't know if he gave Kyrie him. So, so I don't know there. All right, Miss Subtlety. Nuggets, Mavs, Jamal Murray getting knocked to the ground trying to get by Timmy Hardaway Jr. Murray gets up, tried to sneak a little low blow on Hardaway, but not sneaky enough because he was ejected. You know, cameras are everywhere. You can't do this. He's like, okay, I was trying to get up. He was in my way. No, nope. there's certain ways you can get up, my brother. But, you know, I, you have to respect Hardaway because a lot of guys. Yeah, not just going to take it. Yeah, not just going to take Yeah, not going to take that. He definitely acted the right way. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for where the game is at today. But, you know, back in the day, that would have been some trouble. Hmm. When I used to cover the NFL, offensive linemen would tell me, like, what went on at the oh, bottom of the pile oh, when no one's yes. looking. And there was Nasty there was stuff. more of that than you would want. <laughs> yes. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, make confidence. Lakers, Cavs, JaVale McGee decided to again show off his ball handling skills. We've hey. been showing this on the jump. Now, this time it did not go as well as it did the other night. Um, I don't know. Sometimes you do something, you get excited, and then you try it again, and maybe he's flying a little too close to the sun there trying to be the point center, Robert. He's on the trademark. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Robert. He, he's determined. This is his old team. He wants to show these guys, I still have some skills, man. Right. Y'all let me go too soon, but, you know, DeVille is one of those guys, you just want to sit back and watch what he's going to do next. Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's on the trade blocks, so to speak, so I think he's trying to show his talent, but in the summertime, <laughs> he works out as a full guard, so none of this really surprised me when he actually right. has the nerve to do it in the game. <laughs> well, JaVale, not the only one in Cleveland, feeling himself last night. LeBron James mm. absolutely went mm -hmm. off in his first game back in his old home arena in two years. James dropping 46 on his former team. 21 of those points came in the fourth quarter, where he outscored the entire Cavaliers team by himself. And you can see here just how efficient he was, especially from range. He made seven of his 11 threes. Now, as mentioned, he turned it on in the fourth which came about for a little extra motivation from a special spectator who let LeBron hear it after missing a shot close to the end of the third. Take a listen here. Yeah, I know who he is. Um, you know, <laughs> that's not, he's part of the front office group. He was really excited about, about me missing, uh, you know, that shot a little bit more extra than I would have liked. But, you know, he got a roof for his, for his team, obviously. And he was... Uh, you know, he showcased that. So, you know, I knew I had another quarter and uh, the fourth quarter is my favorite. 
<laughs> Matt, come on. Someone who works for the Cavs right. should know better, right? I mean, there's always that one person when a joke is told that kind of laughs a little bit too hard. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? And I kind of feel like that even if they didn't do nothing, you're, you're going to be the reason why. He was definitely the reason why uh, LeBron went for 21 in the fourth quarter and uh, outscored the whole Cavs team. So, you know, he looked for anything similar to what Kobe did. Looked for anything for motivation, and he definitely <laughs> found it. The real part about it, look at the head snap. It was a quick Instant. head snap. Instant. Like, right? oh, no, you did just like he quit. And then he looked back like at him again. Like, he knew who laughed. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I, I heard said, that I got laugh you. I got you. You want to wake up? You want to make wake me up? All I right. got something for you right here. And he went off, you know, true LeBron style in his building. The, the building LeBron built. <laughs> there you go. I, that's all I got to say. And look, our Dave McMenamin reporting. You're not going to sneak much past Dave. Dave found out it was Jason Hillman in the cast front Good office job, Jason. that LeBron had the interaction with. So, yeah, I don't know how he feels this morning, but there you go. Uh, we will be right back after including some amazing Mamba memories. Right now, though, it's time to play one of our favorite games here on The Jumps. Oh, yes, you know it. Something, nothing, or everything. First, Adrian Wojnarowski reporting NBA and players are negotiating the possibility of an all-star game on March 7th in Atlanta. Chris Paul reportedly wants to use the game to provide support to HBCU schools, COVID-19 relief. Remember the league previously canceled the original All-Star Game festivities in Indianapolis. Matt, do you think the NBA considering bringing back an All-Star Game in a pandemic is something, nothing or everything? I think it's everything. Um, I think they'll keep obviously safety first and with Chris Paul, the head of the Players Association, he's always thinking ahead. So obviously it's a great cause for the HBCUs and the, and, the, and the COVID relief, but also for the guys that it could possibly could be their last or someone's first, you know what I mean? So you never want to take those moments away. Um, you know, some people are never fortunate enough to make it. So I agree, obviously keeping safety first is at the utmost, but uh, you know, the fans love it and the games themselves have been so amazing lately. I would love to see an all-star game. I totally agree with Matt. This is everything. And I think the one thing that it really is going to be impressive if they're able to do anything for the HBCUs, because I know this is a, a passion of Chris Paul's and for the NBA to step up, especially during this time of Black Lives Matter movement, it'll be the perfect platform right. for you to just say, hey, look at us. This is what's going on in the country still, but we want to show our support for the HBCU and more importantly for the COVID-19 people who are supporting that and helping out with that. And the fact that it's in Atlanta, you know, the, 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 the blackest city, <laughs> the black city of, of the United States. Yes, Atlanta, yes. you know what I mean? So it's a perfect Atlanta. setting, and, and, and like I said, for the reasons, uh, you know, that Chris Paul laid out, I think it's a great idea. I, I, I mean, Chris's support, right, of the HBCU movement and sort of what he's done to bring attention to, hey, it's not just these universities are here or the support they should get, but young athletes, guys from his AAU program, directing them toward those schools has been really amazing. I appreciate all the reasons why everyone wants to have an all-star game this year, but I am concerned, I'm, I'm going to yeah. say. I don't think we it's can tough. just gloss over health and safety here. And you have had, I sit here every day and I announce cancellation after postponement after postponement. And we have a situation here where we have 30 pods, right, in the NBA. And those pods in, say, the two-week period somebody may be exposed to COVID, right, is kind of what we look at, 10 days, mm -hmm. to whatever. They may interact with one, two, three, four other pods, right, in games that they play and we've seen the reaction of that right the Wizards who got something maybe after contact with the Celtics and then it knocks out their schedule and then it knocks out someone else's schedule that's when you're only mixing three or four pods in any given 10 to 14 day period what happens when you are all taking 30. 20 guys you know for 24 guys from 20 different pods putting them all together with no quarantine on the way in or on the way out because the all-star break is only five days Sticking them together Tough. in Atlanta, which, as yeah. you know, is a city that guys like. Are you telling them <laughs> they have to stay locked in their hotel oh, rooms boy. the whole time? Or are you telling them they can't interact with anybody? Yeah. The logistics um, will be tough, I think. You're but. telling people they can't exchange jerseys or have handshakes or hugs because they're coming two separate pods, right, between teams. Now you're going to stick 24 of them all together and in then send them Atlanta? right back to yes. their individual <laughs> pods. So, I, look, the NBA has been fantastic on health and safety. I trust the leadership of the NBA. I really, really do. So if they have a plan for this, I am excited to hear it. But again, as someone who every day sits here and talks yeah. about COVID's impact on the league, I am curious how they would pull this off. And if they can, 
I'm thrilled to see it. If they can't, I hope there is another way that we can give money support to some of the causes that they we just They can always mentioned. just put it at the end of, this, end of the season. That too, absolutely. And I do <laughs> yeah. love that Elon ending they did in the last game. Yeah. It was so fun. I love the All-Star game in Chicago. It was yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. So I would, sir, I would sir love to see it if safety can be taken into account for. All right, let's talk about the Nets beating the Heat for the second time in three days on Monday. But in those two games where Kyrie, KD, and Harden played, it was James that has taken the fewest shots, only 19 total in two games, along with 19 assists. Here's Harden's post game describing this newfound balance for him. I was in a role for eight years, you know, you know, controlling the ball, dominating the ball. Um, now it's a di different experience for me, but it's it's still great. You got to pick and choose when to be aggressive, when to get your shooters going, when you know to let Katie and Kyrie get going. Once we get a rhythm and that flow, and we kind of start to feel you know each other out more, and our team will have a lot more. Um, you know, flowing throughout the course of the game. Right now, we're, we're trying to find it, and we show really good glimpses of it, but it'll be more consistent. All right, so Robert, and it, Robert Harden with as many <laughs> assists as shot attempts against Miami. Do you think that's something, nothing, or everything? I think I'm going to go with nothing on this one because this marriage is still in the honeymoon, and he's tr still trying to figure things out. So I'm going to say nothing right now because they played the Heat without Jimmy Butler. They played a Heat that's a good team, but they're sure. missing their top dog. So I'm going to say nothing because when you beat a team that mm, doesn't have all this firepower and you still win, so I'm still going to say nothing. I think it's something from a standpoint of this is kind of the evolution of James. You know, yeah. we saw, but if you think about it, his early days in OKC in the fourth quarter, he was the playmaker sure. for Russ and KD. So this is the next step in James's <clears throat> evolution, and I like it. Everyone thought that Kyrie would be the third wheel at the second seat. Kyrie's moved to the two guard, the scoring two guard in honor of Kobe. He's a scoring <laughs> two guard. We know what KD does. So James is able to get everyone else going, but also get his shot at any other time. And I, like I said, I just think that's an evolution to him. My only concern about this team is on the defensive end, but offensively, they're playing against themselves, trying yeah. to get better every single night. So I don't really care about who the opponent is. And you guys both know that progression, right? You've saw it in the league, both I'm sure with yourselves, but also with all the guys you came in contact with over the years. You start out just wanting to make it as an NBA player. Then as you get better, as James Harden did in Oklahoma City, we know there was a little bit of like, well, I could do this. I could start. I could have my own team. I could do these things. And then he spent years in Houston showing us that. The MVP, the individual accolades, the scoring titles, where he moved up in the record books uh, behind Wilt in terms of per season averages. And then after a while, you're like, well, I, I really would like to win a title. And I'm going to sacrifice to that level to get to win one. And at least so far, he's doing that. I just so. wonder how long. Like, it's good now, and he right. seems happy with it now. If it stays at this pace where he's getting 10 shots, 12 shots a game, I wonder if he can stay happy throughout the season knowing that he's sacrificing for the greater of the team. That's yeah. right. I, I, that's my thoughts. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys have sensing. seen that, too. At yes, the beginning, yeah. everyone's yes. happy. Mm -hmm. Little honeymoon. Uh, when that loss, the first loss, or two losses in a row hit you, and you're like, hey, what about me? We'll see. We'll find out. I now want to get to some very, very good news. The Pacers announced today Karis LeVert underwent successful surgery wow. to treat renal cell carcinoma that was on his left kidney. That was first detected during a physical when Karis was traded to Indiana from Brooklyn. No further treatment needed. Karis is expected to make a full recovery, although he will be out indefinitely. He said that he thinks this trade could have saved right. his life, guys, that he would never have had this thorough of physical just randomly in the middle of the season. And this kind of cancer can spread quickly. Wow. So it's pretty yeah. remarkable and certainly remarkable of the Pacers to say they found this out and they didn't void the trade. They right. said, we, we believe in him. We want to keep him. We know he will eventually be healthy and we yeah. want him on the team. Yeah, praying for him and his family right now. Cancer is no joke. I lost my mom to it. So this trade was a blessing in disguise for him. Yeah, it's a huge blessing because think about it. When you get traded to someone, they're going to do it in depth. Physical, yes, different and it's so happy they did it because he was playing and putting up numbers mm -hmm. in Jersey. So, 40. Yeah. And so 40. It, was, it, was, it was a blessing in the sky. I'm so happy that he's going to be fine and he can get back on the court and showing us the, the very talented athlete that he is. Yes, mm -hmm. congratulations to him and his family. We are, as Matt says, thinking of him. All right, coming up, a man who played against Kobe in the NBA 37 times. Zach Randolph joins the job to talk his memories of Kobe and the inspiration he provides. Proud how I feel about you guys. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I God, I love you guys.
Joining us at this time, two-time NBA All-Star, the 2004 Most Improved Player, and the man with one of the best nicknames in NBA history, <laughs> Zebo Zach Randolph. Welcome back to The Jump. So good to have you here with us. And, and much like Kobe Bryant, you were a fierce competitor on the court. But I loved a recent interview you did with Mark Stein of the New York Times talking about how much better you got to know Kobe after your careers were over. In fact, you asked him to coach your daughter, McKinley. How did that change your perception of him, your relationship with him after he retired? I love that you have this window into his post-career life. I mean, it was just, it was great. I mean, you know, she wanted to play. We're moving out here and, you know, I reached out to Kobe and he's like, you know, hey, come in and, um, you know, let's see how it goes. And, uh, you know, how she mixed in with the girls and uh, it was good. You know, it was good. She came in, she fitted in well, and, you know, he worked her, and uh, he bleed in her, man, and uh, it was great. You know what I mean? And uh, just, from, you know, the learning standpoint, and it's just everything he taught her, and, you know, uh, just that mentality, you know, that mama mentality, and, you know, being confident and uh, being a winner. Zach, Zach, do you have any any Coach Kobe stories? I know that uh, he got a chance to work with the Twins, and I asked how often he practiced his team, and he said he had the girls running the triangle offense, working out <laughs> five or six days a week. So I know you were you were living by me in Encino. He's out in Orange County. Do you have any crazy Coach Kobe stories? Because I heard he, he used to put those girls through some things. Uh, yeah, he had put, um, when we first got there, he put McKinley through a 16. And he didn't know what a 16 was. So... <laughs> After practice, he got, you know, all the other girls down there, they shooting and uh, doing whatever. And he like, come on, Norma Kelly. You got to hit the sideline. Uh. Let's do these 16s. Man, she did it. You know, that was her first time ever doing a 16. And uh, <laughs> she was like, Dad. She's like, I wasn't expecting that. I was like, I know that's that mumble, you know. And, you know, but not only that, he got her in the best shape. You know right. what I mean? She was in great shape. And, uh, you know what I mean? When, when he talked, you know, they listened. You know, it was like, you know, it was mesmerized, you know, you know by being coached by one of the greatest players to ever play this game. Absolutely. All right, All right Zebo. here's the thing. Are you surprised, because I know I was, that <laughs> Kobe wanted to coach. You know, guys that good, they usually can't coach because they think they expect everybody to be as great as they are. So what do you expect of that? What do you think of that? Man, I mean, it was great. I mean, you know, I mean, taking his time, you know, taking his time out of retirement and spending, that's what it, that was, that's what it was like by the retirement was them girls, you know, he was dedicated to them. And, uh, you know, they want, they want, every one of them had a college, you know, they wanted to go to. And Kobe's like, you know, what? you want to go here? You want to go there? That's what we're going to do. We're going to get you there. And they work mm -hmm. forward. And, um, you know, that was his life from girls, man. I love the idea of you two who went head to head so many times. You battled him, Zebo, more than, than I. We have lists of who he played against the yeah. most times, and you were near the top of that list. And that you guys became these friends post retirement. Watching your two little girls is so awesome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're going to have Thanks. you back on the show when you can actually come into the studio because we play a game called Thanks. What Were You Thinking? Appreciate and there's really no one else that would be better to find out what you were thinking <laughs> during certain of those moments. So thank you, Zebo. So much coming up on this show. We're going to have today's players talking about Kobe Bryant and the first time they faced him. You will hear from LeBron, KD, so many more in their first matchups with Kobe. This is These are great stories. And to get you ready, here's Vince Carter talking about his first time. He taught them how to be brave and how to keep pushing forward when things get tough. He would sing them silly songs and continue making them laugh. He loved being Gianna's basketball coach. Gigi pulls here, she's a doctor. Our youngest Gianna is 12, and she's practicing playing basketball every single day. One dribble step back. That should be labeled unfair. I asked if he wanted more children, and without hesitation, he said, I would have five more girls if I could. Come on. I'm a girl dad. Good girl. If I had the power to turn back time, I would never use it. I don't think about it. Because then every moment that you go through means absolutely nothing, because you can always go back and do it again. So it loses its flavor, it loses its, its beauty. And things are final, you know, moments won't ever come again. I 
can't believe it's come to an end. To my family. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Very merry on birthday. To you. Thank you guys for all your sacrifice. You guys will always be in my heart. Man, those pictures of Kobe and Gigi, I don't know. I don't know. It's really hard. At this time, I would like to welcome in someone who knew both of them so well. If we're going to be here on this day, I'm so thrilled to be joined by so many people who knew Kobe at his best, and that was often when he was with his little girls. We now have NBA and WNBA skills coach, co-founder of the Through the Lens skills training app with Carmelo Anthony, and coach to Gianna Bryant on Team Mamba. Alex Bazell joins The Jump. Thanks so much for stopping by, Alex. Uh, I'm really thrilled Thanks, that you were able to spend time with us today because Gigi and the girls from Team Mamba, I, it was amazing watching them together. And we were just hearing from Zebo how Kobe wanted you guys to be running them through, you know, skills drills, yoga sessions, uh, the full, full boat of training. What was it like to coach Gigi Bryant knowing you had the ultimate athlete dad there working with you with, with her? <laughs> uh, well, you know what? It's it, it was an interesting relationship that we formed, you know, like most parents and I've worked with younger players in the past, of course. Most parents, they, they try to live through their children. And with Kobe, it was so unique because you knew he had all the knowledge and experience in the world that he could pass on to Gigi and her teammates. But he felt this need to have this divide of at some point he just wanted to be dad and he wanted to have another voice in there. And, you know, for him to trust me with that, uh, that certainly meant a lot to me. And of course, we spend so much time talking about Kobe because he lived his life in public. But Gigi was starting to, and we were starting to see what those of you who knew her so well know about her, how fierce she was, how determined she was, how funny and sweet she was. Can you tell us a little bit more about Gigi on the day-to-day? -day? Because the potential that was lost on that day a year ago, it's, it's gaping. Yeah, um, you know, obviously, who she was as a player she was able to do things that quite honestly a lot of nba players couldn't do like she could shoot a fadeaway over her left shoulder as a righty which to give you an idea you know if i start working with an nba player it usually takes them three to four weeks before it's even respectable so for her <laughs> to have that at that young of an age she had so much of her dad in her and, and quite honestly a lot of vanessa too you know she mm -hmm. was so fierce that even kobe had to try to get her to back off a little bit and, wait excuse me are you times. serious Come yeah on. i know yeah <laughs> and that that was a sight to behold so um you know she was she was as competitive as ever but as you mentioned when she was off the court she was such a, a sweet girl um and you could just tell how much her teammates loved her and we know what kobe's style was as a player what about when he was talking to gianna about what he wanted or what she would say back to him what what were they like in terms of that competitiveness because i know vanessa has called Gigi kind of kobe's little clone in that way yeah, well, Kobe was so great about, he wanted her to find her own way. He didn't always want to give her the answers. And he wanted to just pique her curiosity. And, and that's what he did with all the girls on the team. Um, so to give him that leeway, it, it honestly changed the way I thought about um, how I approach training younger athletes. Yeah. And, you know, he, he talked about it in a scenario of, if think about a young kid that's learning a new language, how how much quicker they can pick stuff up than maybe someone your age. And that's how he went about training. And he was like, let's just throw everything at them, see what they can absorb and see what they naturally want to kind of pick up on their own. So um, just the way he went about it was so unique in that standpoint, because when you, when you accomplish so much at, at whatever it is, you generally want to force your ideas or your way of what made you successful onto the next generation. And he kind of let everyone find their own way and he kind of plugged along and gave answers when he could. And I know you have been working toward equality in hoops yourself with your own projects. And I did want to ask you kind of Kobe's impact on the women's game and women's basketball. I've talked to several WNBA players who have said they think Gigi could have ended up being the greatest women's basketball player 
to come. And that includes someone like Diane Taurasi, who, of course, the GOAT. Uh, just what they thought she might be able to do both within the game and for the game. And that started with Kobe, who recognized the importance of the WNBA and the modeling that gave children about what they could do. How did you see all of that and have incorporated that into your your projects as you go forward, too? Well, with, with any young person or, or professional or anyone trying to find their way, you know, the two biggest things is competitiveness and passion. And she had that at the highest level. Um, you know, there's a lot of very talented people. There's a lot of skilled players. Um, but if you don't want to constantly improve, if you don't aren't looking for ways to kind of reach that next level, you're always going to get capped out. Uh, and that was never an issue with Gigi. So, you know, what her potential could have been, it was really, it really came down to her. Um, and that's probably why so many people thought she had a chance to be one of the greatest players to probably ever play women's basketball and basketball in general. Um, and, you know, what with Kobe and I, we shared such a I think how we got along so well is we both had very similar interests, not only in, in the men's game, but the women's game just as much. So, you know, what we've been trying to do and specifically with Through the Lens and obviously my fiance is also a WNBA player. Yep. And, has accomplished a lot in her young career so far is we've always shared that interest and in, in feeling like if we can continue to help do our part um, to help elevate the women's game, then, you know, there's, there's really something there that, that the last couple of years, you've seen the momentum that it's gained and Kobe was certainly helping that. But um, I think what he'd be most proud of is how many other players have stepped up to the plate uh, specifically in the last year. Well, Alex Bazell, thank you so much for joining us. That perspective on Kobe, on Gigi. Being the coach of Gigi Bryant, working with Kobe Bryant, that is a tall order. And the fact that you guys had such a fantastic relationship really speaks to the time you were able to spend. So thank you for spending time with us today. We really appreciate. And the jump is continuing for another hour to celebrate the life of Kobe Bryant, his daughter Gianna, and the seven other victims of the crash that happened, of course, a year ago. Over the past few weeks, I've actually been talking to current NBA stars. We interviewed everyone over the past few weeks, and we wanted to celebrate Kobe's life. And what the best way to do that by starting with asking stars to reflect on the first time they played against the Black Mamba. Take a look. The first game I played against Kobe. The very first time I played against him. The first time I ever got like actually playing against him. You remember, like, damn, like you know, I'm I'm, I'm on a court with Kobe. Like, I was uh, just in awe. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I could even uh, do it any justice. Really, it's a guy who I would tape on my wall when I lived in Spring Hill. In apartment 602 to be able to share the floor with him was um was like a you know for any kid that has aspirations or or, or has a inspiring moments from someone it's just like a, a sense of awe i remember most just watching somebody that i literally grew up watching on youtube Black Mamba strikes again. and I, I remember just watching you know just like i'm really about to line up against kobe i remember lining up the jump ball against andrew biden and looking over and seeing you know, Kobe, and it's, that's when it was surreal for me. That's when I, re I realized I was really a part of the NBA. I think the thing, the thing that stood out most to me about playing Kobe that first time was his pregame warm-up. Why is he working out at 4 o'clock and it's a 7.30 game? By the time I finished watching his workout, I had, like, missed my lift, uh, my treatment time. You know, as a young guy, <laughs> you, you get the early slots, and once you miss it, it's over. I had missed everything, and... I think for me personally, that was just a moment like in my life where it was like, yo, like I'm sitting here watching Kobe. Nothing else really mattered to me at that point. What were you trying to do out on the court that night? Um, for me not to get, you know, 50 dropped on me. My rookie year, we played against them in the playoffs and I was just trying my best. I was just talking smack. I was just in his ear. He wasn't, he wasn't phased by it. Uh, at the forum, um, my rookie year, we played against him, and uh, I got switched on to him in an ISO situation. I'm, you know, scrawny, 170 pound, 
rookie coming in and the look he gave me was so damn disrespectful, it was crazy. He hissed like an actual snake. You know, whenever he wanted the ball, he would like, he would make a hissing sound. And it threw me all the way off. Like, I didn't know that that was a thing. He was just testing me. Like, he was just testing to see what I was made of. He was testing to see what type of mentality I had. Um, and he was just testing me to see, you know, who I was as a, as a, as a person and what I stood for. I guess I, I wanted to gain his respect so much at, at that moment. And he was just stone faced, straight killer mode the whole game. It's down to seven. Starting to make his move for the win. He got the lead for him. I remember we got our ass kicked. I remember that. You know, I think I'm a pretty, you know, physical defender and all that stuff. And I'm a young pup. And I could tell you, he beat the living out of me without even having the ball. <laughs> I always tell the story. Uh, I got a switch on Kobe. Um, he was posting me up. I blocked his shot in the ball. Bounced the half court and I went running after full speed. And it was a big moment for me because I could brag to my friends that I blocked Kobe Bryant's shot. This guy's a blur. Kobe, D3, got it. He got the ball back and shot a three. He said, the play continues, young fella. He said that. John Wall, get this one. The very first time um, was actually here in LA. It was my assignment uh, to guard Kobe. I'm obviously having B. Shaw as an assistant. And B. Shaw is like John Adam. Um, egging them on, getting them riled up, talking mess from the bench. Here I am in the middle uh, while all of this is going on. I was guarding him and he, uh, you know, he got into his, his back down, um, his patent, uh, pump fake, and I went flying for it. You know, a young guy trying to go block his shot, I went flying for it. And uh, he caught me in the air, he ran down. Uh, specifically ran down to where B. Shaw was and uh, yelled at B. Shaw, uh, check the young feather for feathers. The first time that I played against him was when I was in Chicago and he was with the Lakers. And I just remember him asking Michael Jordan all these questions on the court the whole time. But I think what ultimately made him who he was was that that audacity to ask Michael Jordan for pointers in his very first game against him. Think about most 18 year olds, they'd be scared to death. To, to go against Michael, uh, and he was just inquisitive. It's pretty remarkable. He was just our generation, uh, Jordan, in terms of like iconic moves, ISO stuff, fadeaways, game winners. I try to emulate um, how he moved down to what he said to the, to you guys in the media, to how he worked out before the games, what he watched. I would really try to study it as much as possible. I would never told him that, but. As a, as a younger player, I was really just copying everything he did. Um, he was my idol growing up, and it was just a, a blessing to, to be on the same court as him and, and compete. It was, it was, it was me and him. Um, nobody on that court mattered. Uh, nothing else mattered. Um, it was everything for me, you know? It, it, it was everything for me. It was the best uh, moment of my life. The best moment of his life. Thank you so much to all the players who participated. I cannot tell you guys how much fun it was to talk to everybody over these past few weeks. Thank you so much to our producer, Michael Bodmer, who put that together so, so beautifully. And I wanted to turn and ask you guys the same question, Matt. What was it like the very first time you went up against Kobe Bryant? It was amazing because I was fresh off a call up, but my journey starts back at UCLA when I used to sneak back into Poly Pavilion and watch him work out because you know early on it wasn't much he would always try to find time to come up to UCLA so we'd see him walking on campus and working out and I like when Draymond said he sat there and just lost track of time I completely mm -hmm. feel that because I, well, I went there one time and just watched him for like an hour 45 work as hard as he possibly can and it kind of I was just like okay well I'm gonna have to guard something like that one day so <laughs> First time we played was fun, but my more memories when Draymond said that was, you know, getting lost just watching him work out. For me, I have an opportunity to be there when he was a rookie right. and watch his growth. And I think the biggest jump was when he ended the 99 season and then we got a new coach. We went from the Forum to Staples Center. Mm -hmm. And that summer, I don't know what he did, but he went in the lab and he changed his whole game up. And he became this iconic player that we all, he was good then, yeah. but he, he went mm -hmm. to a whole nother mm -hmm. mode. He, he went into beast mode, so to say, and he helped us win a championship. And that Kobe Bryant, and I, I, I remember like yesterday, I'm getting, on the, I'm getting off the elevator. You know, you have to do those physicals, mm -hmm. and you, that's when you see players. And I'm looking at his body, I'm like, dude, 
<laughs> what did you do? <laughs> he got bigger, he got stronger, he got faster, he got afro. <laughs> it, it all came together, and, and it was just, it was just to watch him go from the guy who was shooting the air ball in the, in, in the playoffs right. against the Jazz to being this guy that took over in the finals when Shaq filed out. And it, it was just amazing to be a part of that journey with him. Well, I want to now bring in a man, one of your teammates during Kobe's rookie year and certainly for a lot longer, Mr. Byron Scott. Thank you so much, friend, for joining us. Kobe gave a great shout out to Byron in his Mamba Mentality book, mentioning how much he learned from you early in your career. So, Byron, what was it like for you the first time you faced up against Kobe in practice? Because, as Robert said, he came to y'all as a young pup. Well, you know, Big Shot knows that, you know, I mean, we had some great practices, some very competitive practices. Big Shot, big time competitor himself. Uh, Kobe at, at 17, 18 years old just wouldn't back down to anybody. You know, he, he wanted to take that challenge. And that's why we got so close is because he wanted to ask all these questions about the NBA and how he could take advantage of his talents. And what were people going to try to do to take advantage of him? And, you know, as a rookie, you always know people will come at you, especially vets. They're going to come at you. You got to be ready for that. They're going to try to take advantage of you. But he, his, you know, his mentality even then was that he was going to be the best. You know, he was going to outwork everybody. You know, we, we all knew he had talent. That was obvious from day one. Uh, and you had to kind of guide that talent. But in the long run, we knew that talent was going to take over. And the work ethic just made him that much more special. Uh, you know, but he said from day one to me, when, in, in all the conversations that we had, uh, that he wanted to be, you know, wanted to be one of the greatest players in the league, and I looked at him, and we, we you know, eye to eye, and I said, "Man, the way you were, you will be." Hmm. And uh, again, he turned out being one of the greatest of all time. You know, the thing about Kobe also, he wasn't afraid to ask questions. A lot of guys are afraid to ask questions, and Kobe would go to you if he wants to know about another player. He would ask questions. So that was the best thing about him. He was going to learn some way or another. He was going <laughs> to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I like about all three of you guys had interactions with Kobe very early and then, of course, also very late. And Byron, you were in such a crazy position. We just showed that page from Kobe's book. The photo he put up of the two of you was him hugging you. I believe that's an Andrew Bernstein special and just <laughs> thanking you for all of the conversations that you had. But that not only came when he was a young player, it came when you turned around and then coached him at the end of his career. What was that like to span the very beginning to then, of course, the very end? You know, the, the last two years that I had uh, in LA coaching uh, and having and having a KB on that team, it, it was the best two years of my life in coaching. And, hmm. and you know, I had some, some great success early, you know, with New Orleans and, and New Jersey. Um, but it can't compare to the last two years I spent with, 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 with Kobe here in LA. Um, we got to re, you know, reunite, reconnect. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. You know, I got a lot of five o'clock a.m. calls in the morning about <laughs> what was going like, man, do you ever sleep? You know, I mean, he, he was just one of those guys that, you know, uh, was driven, and I loved that about him. And and like, you know, like Robert just said, you know, wasn't afraid to ask questions. Uh, you know, and, and that's the thing I love about it. even at 37 years old. You know, wasn't afraid to ask me questions about, uh, you know, game planning. Uh, practice planning, uh, w whatever it may be. And um, he, he was just one of those guys that he just felt that every day you can learn. You know, every day you can get better as a basketball player, every day you can learn as a person. And he took that, you know, literally. And, and, I, and I know that's one of the reasons that he changed his number to 24, because he was always talking about, you know, you got 24 hours in a day. Mm. And that day, you know, those 24 hours, you can get better. Mm. And, and I love that about him because of his spirit and his passion. Not only for basketball, but for life. You know, we know how much he loved his girls and his family. Uh, but the, the the most fear competitor I've ever been around. I, you know, Magic Johnson was an unbelievable competitor in practice. You know, I've been with you know Big, Big Shot when we had practice with Kobe. Was and how how competitive he was. I know how competitive you know my man Matt Barnes is. I know that dude. He just goes out. And he go. He go. He go guard you. He gonna make it rough on you. But Kobe just had that about him that every day. In practice, he was going to give you 110% and he was going to go at you. And he didn't respect you if you didn't go back at him. Right. That's the one thing about it. He did not respect you if you didn't go back at him. If you, if you looked at him and just thought he was bigger than God or, you know, I can't, he, he didn't have no respect for you. But if you went at him, you know, he had all the, all the respect for you. And that's the thing that I loved about it. his competitive nature, his passion for the game, his passion for life, his passion for his family. I mean, it, you know, 
those two years, like I said, Rich, I'll never forget those two. As bad as our team was, <laughs> that was the best two years I've ever had as a coach. That's an amazing statement, Byron. You're someone who won multiple rings, played with Magic, as you said, coached in the NBA Finals, and yet your two best years coaching were those. A really great message that it is not it is not all about the wins and losses, and especially with someone like Kobe Bryant. He was known as such a winner, but it's what he gave us all along the way that we really want to celebrate today. It's about so much more than just the titles. Byron, thank you so much for joining us today. Excellent to see you, my friend. Up next, we're going to hear from Pau Gasol as well, opening up about his close friendship with Kobe, his experience. What did you learn about Kobe the man, not just the player, in talking to Pau? You covered both of these guys, and yet that conversation seems like it brought so much. I mean, to be honest, Rachel, like I covered them up close, and I never realized how close they were until really until after Kobe passed and we saw all of the, the social media posts from Vanessa and, and, and Kat and Pau and just the interactions that they've had. And I, I couldn't, you know, I, I was like, wow, I, I saw, I was up close to it and I didn't know. And it reminded me a little of Kobe's um, relationship with Michael Jordan, where we, we kind of realized how close they were after Michael gave that eulogy. And I, I respect that because he kept something for himself, right? Like he shared so much of himself with all of us and with the world, but he did keep certain relationships for himself out of the public eye. And, 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 I, to and I respect that and I think it's beautiful. Um, and you know, for me is, I think we all, what we learned over the past year as we've all been telling stories is just who he was as a man. I mean, he, he used to like email me when he was writing, remember he would write those stories yes. from the Players' <laughs> Tribune? And he would say, what do, you, what do you think of these stories I've been writing? I go, you know, I was like polite. I was like, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. He goes, no, Kobe. what do you really think? <laughs> right? And he, he was like, I, I was like, you want me to like read it and red pen it? And he goes, yes, red pen the <laughs> SH <laughs> out of it. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he wanted, like, he wanted a real critique. And like, because he wanted to be a great writer and he wanted to know what it took. And I remember we were doing a, a story kind of in his last year. And he really wanted to know what my writing process was like because he was transitioning into that world. And so I, I told him, I, I usually like to, uh, I get a soundtrack kind of, I pick songs that, that fit the theme of the story and I, I, I get a little method actor about it. And, and I go, tell me some of the songs you listen to. And he hit me back like immediately. <laughs> and Rachel, you wouldn't even believe the songs. Like it'd be <laughs> Trans-Siberian Orchestra and Sia. <laughs> Um, it would be Kanye, it would be Tribe Called Quest, it was like all over the map, but it was the types of songs that he would listen to when he was in his zone and he was pushing himself. And the stories he wanted to hear from me about being a writer, were it, that's what he got the most excited about. And he's like, I want to hear that because that's when I hear the passion in your voice. And I, I just knew that's who he was. I mean, that's, that's Kobe the man. He, he got excited about about things that other people were passionate about and he wanted to help you take that passion that was inside of you and make the most of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ramona and I got a chance to talk on the phone the other night for about 45 minutes while she was finishing <laughs> up this piece with Pal. And one thing Pal said, and I told Ramona that night too, Kobe was so cool on the bus, in the locker room, so chill. And I used to tell Kobe, I was like, yo, why can't the rest of the world see this dude? And he said, yeah. These MFers can't see that side of me, you know what I mean? Like, he always wanted to keep that Mamba wall up, but it was beautiful to see that, you know, Pal used to, you know, kind of work on him, too. Like, it's okay. Like, you're still a bad man, but you could still be, you know, show the world the rest of the other side. But he just, until he was done, he wouldn't do it. Yeah, for me, I, I am so jealous of everybody that got to know Kobe in that sense because when I got to know Kobe, it was just straight was laser <laughs> focus. It's like, I want to be yeah. the best. And he was like a machine. He was a robot. He was p pretty much the Terminator. And he let some of us in, but not the degree that he's let these other guys in. So I'm so jealous of all these <laughs> other guys. I got to know him a little bit, but not like these other guys. And, he, and, and, I'm, and I say it again, I am jealous of you, Matt. I'm jealous, man. <laughs> well, it's, it's fun. You know, we work so much with Tracy McGrady. And, and as I mentioned earlier in this show, they were so close when they both came in, close in age, coming right from high school. They spent summers together, staying at each other's parents' houses. And then there was that decade or so of Kobe's tunnel vision. And then after, Robert, as you said, they got to know each other having kids on the AAU circuit together and talking about just rekindling that deep deep friendship the people who got to be let in by Kobe like Powell like T-Mac like Matt so many of us who are lucky to be around him not just at the beginning but also at the end and Ramona you certainly were right there so thank you for joining us when we return we will also have the man the myth the legend 
the truth. Paul Pierce joining us as we <laughs> unveil the 24 greatest Mamba moments. Kobe Bryant, this is Jam Session coming at you. These are the type of moments that I live for. You gotta show me. Five I told you you gonna get it, man. You gotta show him. Welcome back to The Jump. I am Rachel Nichols alongside Robert Ori, Matt Barnes, and we now welcome in the MVP of the 2008 Finals, of course, took place between the Celtics and Kobe's Lakers. Future Hall of Famer, Paul What's Pierce, up, thank you for being with us. Be we had to move to the big part of the set because we got Paul with us <laughs> now. Paul, two NBA Finals you played against Kobe. You guys mm -hmm. played against each other, though, 39 oh, times. Wow. <laughs> that Celtics-Lakers rivalry, you two yeah. were the faces there. But I want to take you back to the very beginning. I'm going to ask yeah. you the same question I asked these guys, so many current players. What do you remember about the very first time you faced Kobe Bryant? Oh, man. I I'll never forget this. Um, so when I first came into the league, I played small for my whole life. I came into the league, I'm I got moved to two guard, right? And so now I'm guarding Kobe, and I just remember he stole a ball from me, and he went down. I couldn't catch him. Usually I'm like, all right, I could catch him. You know, I, I was pretty fast as a youngster. I just thought how fast he was. And I was just like, every time they got the rebound, he gone. I'm like, I can't keep up with this dude, man. I'm like, it made me reevaluate my position. You know what? I think I'm gonna have to go back to small forward. Because right? playing the two guard, I just, he was just so fast. Like, man, you know what? Man, we need to uh, make a trade. I'm gonna go back to the small forward. I don't wanna have to deal with this for the next 10 years. Kobe could do that to you, right, guys? Yes, good. I was incredible. I was like, wow. Absolutely. All right. Well, to honor the legend of Kobe, we have decided to spend the rest of this show counting down the top 24 Mamba moments. And some of these guys who played with and against him, who knew him best, are going to chime in here. So number 24, Kobe winning the 97 dunk contest as a rookie, people. Watch this. Nothing. I'm with the swagger already. You can tell that dude nothing. Fresh out of high school, getting the dunk contest, man. Uh, uh, so he had the legs. This, this is when the stars still competed in the dunk contest. Right. This is what you gotta love. I mean, thank you. Man, you gotta love that. I think a lot of people forget that Kobe had hops back in the oh, day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not gonna forget watching this. Number 23, Kobe performing a spike block on Ray Allen. Ooh. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> that was like big brother versus little brother right there. <laughs> That's how I do my son Prince right, right now. Oh, you gonna get the steal? I'm gonna pay you back, though. I'll pay you back. Take that. Talk about hops, Look how long he was up there. <laughs> Waiting for it. Right? And we all know Ray got hops, too. He right. just, just right. couldn't jump with the mamba. So he was like, oh, wait, it's all good. I'll just be up here. You you get here whenever you can. Number 22, Kobe oh. on Dwight Howard. Take a Ooh, listen. This Ooh. was a uh, curious because of this man, Kobe Bryant, to take over. It's the first time I ever got dunked on, and it had to be Kobe Bryant. So, uh... Every time I see him come down the lane, I just get flashbacks, and hopefully it won't happen again. <laughs> I baptize him. I, I, turn, I, turn, I turn him into a defensive force. Here's another look from a different angle. This one right into your living room. Ooh, that was tough. Man, you're just, a, just my, saddle someone like that, man. My only thing is, how is this number 22? <laughs> it's going to get good. It's about to get good. About to get good. That would have been my number one. Man, that was tough. Oh my God! Get to the paint and think about this. It's like most guys are gonna try. Like, ah, better not. I'm just gonna ride this one out. And Kobe just rolled him back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Number 21, guys. Kobe's clutch buckets against the Blazers in 2004. That's the Kobe stopper, ain't it? Oh yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that's the Kobe stopper, right? Hey, he, wait. he said he was a Kobe Seth stopper. Man, said so it, right? many times Seth in practice. Proclaimed. <laughs> Man, oh my goodness, Ooh. this was crazy. I apologize oh, to everyone man. from Portland for reopening this trauma, but Ooh. it was incredible. Oh, beautiful. Ruben remembers. <laughs> Number 20, Kobe's one-handed alley-oop against the Sixers in 2000. Oh my oh. goodness. 
Nasty. That was crazy. Mm-hmm. That was about as bad as a pass you can throw. Yeah, I was getting ready to say that. That pass was awesome, B-Shaw. <laughs> other side of the rim. Yeah, other B-Shaw side of the made him a highlight. <laughs> That's how you get good alley-oops, though. The oh, yeah. worse the pass, the better the highlight. On the opposite side of the rim he was on. And for Kobe to go get it, though, you know, most people are like, oh, it's a bad pass, right. but he still goes and gets it. I'm sorry, Alan. All right, number 19, Kobe's baseline dunk against the T-Wolves in 2003. Take a listen to this one. Oh man, I remember this on ticket. Oh man. Oh, oh, come on, man. Oh my. When you dunk on the big ticket, then oh my. God. Hey, he's got a couple dunks on me like this. I'm just hoping they didn't make the list. Ooh. That's tough. You know, as I'm watching this, I'm like, did he just dunk that? Yep. Yeah, that one he just, just, the one against no the Knicks, too. So. Oh, God. Shout out to our friend Kevin Harlan. Great call on that game. So many more. Number 18, Kobe hits a turnaround three with his off hand, people. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Man, even, I don't even know if I've attempted a jump shot. I, I remember when he broke his right hand. That's right. He was at UCLA. I'm telling you, he went through a whole workout like he was a left-handed player. That used to just you were watching him like, practice. Some days he just come to practice. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to do everything left hand. You look at him like, really, dude? <laughs> and he getting buckets left-handed. He did it. <laughs> he was hitting them. He did it. Number 17, Kobe dunking on. Yes. Yao Ming. Ooh, get up, big fella. Over the Great Wall. <laughs> Ooh, not peop- not a lot of people went over the Great Wall, but Ooh, no, Kobe uh, certainly did. And it's, I'm just always there in the background, just watching in amazement <laughs> at the Ooh. things he can do. It's always so great when you can see it live right. and watch these moments and be like, dude, really? Ooh, all right. <laughs> Robert, I am going to point out, you did more than watch. You have seven rings to prove it, no, several with I, I Kobe. Love, you love watching Kobe, man. It was some of the things he would do. And, and Matt knows, it's things he used to do in practice. Incredible. And he'd be like, wow. So all you. Hmm. The, 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 the high, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm laughing so much to myself remembering, and you guys would go through these moments, too, where, you know, you guys were just a little bit, especially early on, right, trying to prove things? Footwork. That's what you're talking about, Robert, right? He wanted that Hakeem footwork. Oh, yeah, you know, he's one of the best at doing this, and a lot of guys at home try to mimic this, but it ain't the same. No. <laughs> <laughs> Number 15, Kobe Duncan on Ben Wallace during preseason of his rookie year. Sound oh, up on this one. Did he try to take a charge? Yeah, uh, in Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> Here we got a dribble drive, change of direction by Kobe. Oh, oh, man. Man. Ben never tried to take a charge after that. I and then stood the over him. To see you talk yeah. about elevation. Chick, he went up High school the kid. Yeah. Preseason. Pre-season. Rookie year. Yeah. People weren't scared of Ben until he got the throw. That is not a charging Woo. foul. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> Amazing. Number 14, Kobe's buzzer beater against the Heat, 2009. Leg it. Got him. Great shot. He didn't call bank. He called <laughs> gang. <laughs> he called gang. Well, you used to go shot for shot launching with Kobe. You knew he would always come back at you, though, right? Mm-hmm. Without question. Come on, man. <laughs> Great contest. So he came into Boston shot. and took 41 shots. Wow. <laughs> come on. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> Number 13, Kobe's MVP revenge dunk on Steve Nash in the oh, 2006 goodness. playoffs. Oh. Mm. I like the little hang on the rim. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And Steve's just like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm down. Good. Thank you. That's my MVP <laughs> trophy, Steve. You know I deserved it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm. Number 12, Kobe showing off an MSG in 2003. Remember, this was during the nine-game streak of 40-point games for Kobe. Oh, yeah. Windmill baseline dunk right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, it was incredible with this, this, this streak he went on. But the other thing about it, we just let go on it then. Just go, young fella. We right. win and go. Do your thing. <laughs> Come on, Spree. Come on. 40 point, 40 point, 40 point, 40 point. Number 11, Kobe's bang out in the 2002 finals. Robert, you remember this, right? Oh, of course, right here. You know, Kobe was going. Oh, like, my oh gosh. gosh. You got yeah. murdered. Man. Looking over sweet, at B. Scott, it? talking trash, you know, <laughs> his mentor. That was a sweet. You guys swept him, right? Yeah, we swept him. <laughs> Saw McCullough, come on. I think he retired after that. <laughs> yeah, we swept him. No biggie. Oh.
Oh, my Oof. gosh. Come on, Cole. Just Jason Kidd. Eh, whatever. You know, Cole was like, uh, we, we don't beat these guys. I'm just going to get my numbers. I'm getting numbers. Where are my numbers at, Cookie? <laughs> Jason Kidd. <laughs> Number 10, Kobe improvising on the break against the Nuggets in 2003. They need some help. Ooh, good pass. Right this was crazy. Mm. If you did this to me, man, I mean, we got to get into a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there are so many of these moments. Because, no, something got to happen. This is, this is, come on. Hey, I mean, the thing about this is Cole and I had Goodness, this thing where I'd be like, Cole, watch the press, watch the press. And Cole's eyes ahead. would light up. Okay, if he knew down, I saw down, something, I would do that baseball pass to him, he'd go down and duck it. Come on, well, look, it look, look, look. Behind the back right. of the Number nine, Kobe's first all-star appearance in 98. No, 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 you can't 360 on me, dog. Come on. Some guy. Oh, that's Corey. Oh, wow. All right, now baby. we're moving on. Number nine, Kobe's first all star appearance in 98. Let's go. Ooh, 98. This was against MJ, remember? This is what they call when idols become rivals. Yep. Woo. This was amazing in the Last Dance documentary to kind of get some of the behind the scenes in this from MJ's perspective, right? He was not bashful in his all star. Yeah, he was you know, not. He came out to do his thing. <laughs> Full speed ahead. And you heard Steve Kerr talking about, of course, you know, how much he just asked MJ a million questions all the time, yeah. even while they were playing. Mm. Absolutely incredible. All right, guys, we've got the top eight mom today. Remembering Kobe and Gianna one year later, number 24 will never again be worn by a Dallas Maverick. Our thoughts are with the Bryant family today and always that's very special really really nice of the mavericks to do welcome back to the jump i'm rachel nichols still hanging with paul pierce robert ori matt barnes and guys we're continuing our celebration of kobe's life with a countdown of the most memorable mamba moments of his career we have reached the final eight number eight kobe hits two clutch buckets against the suns in the 2006 playoffs oh. Robert, what you uh, got here? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> look how Devin George, get this out of my hand. Get it to the guy you know who's going to score. Yeah. So he did a smart thing there. Yeah. You knew what was going to happen here. In and out. You got can't it. let him get the two. shot off. Come on. What was, it, two. what was it like as an opponent when you knew before it was going to happen what he was going to do and he did it anyway? Bad feeling. Bad feeling. Bad feeling. <laughs> Man, <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> he beat us a few times. Number seven, 2000 yeah. finals game four, Lakers Pacers. Shaq fouled out. Kobe took over on what he called a throbbing ankle to take a 3-1 lead over Indiana. Yeah, this was after the Jalen did the sneak under, you know, had he missed game three. But he took over in game four and just showed them what, you know, we could do without Shaq. And Kobe mm. was just amazing in this series. And, Thank you, Cole, for my three, buddy. <laughs> three of seven. <laughs> Must be nice. Just saying. <laughs> Everyone on this panel has that championship jewelry, except for me. All right, number six, 2005, Kobe outscoring the entire Dallas Mavericks team. Maybe this is why they retired his number. At the end of the third <laughs> quarter, Kobe had 62 points. The entire Mavs team had 61. Wow. See, after this game, all the kids on the video game started using one player to score all the points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> change the game with the video game? Change the video game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, all right, I'm going to just go out and score 60 with Kobe. <laughs> and then they tried to do it with the other players, and you couldn't. Right. <laughs> this is one of those games where, like, no, if somebody asked you, did you play for the Dallas Mavericks in 2005? Like, nope, no, I didn't. Nope, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> Number five, game seven of the 2000 Western Conference Finals. Kobe finding Shaq for that iconic alley-oop. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, remember, I was in my dorm room at UCLA watching this, man. We were going crazy. <laughs> I was going crazy, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this past, I was like, no, that's too high. But Big Diesel time. went up and got that. Uh, top of the yeah. square. That Portland team was low. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Number four, game Memphis seven of the 2010 four. Finals. I'm sorry, Paul. Kobe oh, earning man. his fifth ring after beating the Celtics. 